All right, so what do we got to share today? Got a handful, the wind's ripping. I had to go to the house. I've got a lot going on, man. This move's gonna be a bit to do. Bought a, got a, bought a real cool farm. There's gonna be a lot of work to do there once you take possession of it. So I'm getting as much as this done as I can because this is not gonna be going at this pace for much longer, unfortunately. I've been told that I have to start making a real living here pretty quick. So here we go. Uh, what do we got? Um, all right. This one is possibly going to be going on for a while. You know, I mentioned a while back that every once in a while, as long as we keep everybody coming here and sharing honestly, feeling safe, you know, we get a lot of the similar similar experiences shared from people who need to get off the chest, and we want that. We want every single one of everybody to come on here and share honestly. And as long as this ride keeps going, guaranteed, every once in a while, somebody's going to come, come up for air, and they're going to kick us in the face with some hardcore reality. Now, this one particular... Uh, man that emailed me i just caught one of his emails and he was basically saying he, is, he had given up this is the last time he's going to try to email me and unfortunately for him and probably many of you out there you think that i'm bypassing your emails when i haven't even seen them yet i'm i'm catching emails that were sent over a year ago and they weren't even looked at you know so there's nothing i can do about it and i know there's a lot of people out there offering up to share some assistance but let's face it there is enough people out there right now trying to sink this ship that uh, I would have to be a complete idiot to select somebody off the internet to crack open the emails and help me out. It's just the way it is, unfortunately. We just can't do that, all right? But it, once I get moved into the new farm and get things set up and get a new studio built too in the man cave there, a lot of, th a lot of things are gonna be changing for the better in a big way. But anyways, until then, you just got to put up with me and my pace and uh, but what I'm saying is I'm going to share this guy's email. I don't know if I got the first one here or not, but I'm going to share this one with you. And these are going to keep going. And we're going to see if, I mean, there's a strong possibility. This is possibly one of these people that are about to kick us in the face with some huge knowledge and reality. You never know. But I'm going to share it. So here we go. Hey, Steve, I'm going to tell you the story of my lifetime with the Sasquatch slash Dogman beings of Southern Georgia. I've tried to contact you many times to no avail. This will be the only time I contact anyone again, ever. As a youth, I had a brother diagnosed schizophrenic. As I started kindergarten, my father would drive me a quarter mile from our little trailer to my aunt's house so I could catch the bus there. An hour or two before sunrise, as I'd look out the car window, these beings would run up to and alongside the car and look at me, scaring the shit out of me. Hearing the talk and seeing the way my brother was treated, I knew I couldn't say anything all the while figuring I was schizophrenic also. I didn't want anyone to worry for me, so I just kept quiet, huddled under the covers of my aunt's house, sweating profusely the whole while. It was hell. Mitch happened, much happened in between, but fast forward to 2017. My kids grown, successful lives and education and process in different states. They're brilliant and talented in ways they do not even recognize yet. After a shitty divorce, I began hearing impossibly loud tree breaks and did what I trained myself to do, ignore it in hopes of ignoring insanity, or so I thought. One day, I walked down a little dirt road to where I thought the noise was coming from, and a wooded area that was on my back acreage. I was amazed and terrified to see a huge male forest man breaking the top out of a good-sized pine. The sound of it breaking was so loud it hurt, and I started staying at my buddy's house down the road. My brother's a country away, all in an attempt not to deal with the fearful sight I witnessed. I became encompassed with a strong urging to study, read, and gather all information impossible. The urging wasn't specific, so I had to train myself to read. Study anything I could with no real direction. It was hard to do after a, a fall of 20 feet onto concrete. Migraines ensued, but after a couple of months I was an effective studier again. And that always had been my passion, as I used to think the curriculum of school if studied and understood effectively and told it would keep my mind from then thought schizophrenic hallucinations at bay. When I began returning to my home place, I visited the area again to find all the treetops were broken out of a squared acre. I'd estimate it to be. I have pics on several old phones, chronolo 
chronolo <laughs> chronologizing, <laughs> chronologizing the entire process. I'm skipping much for time's sake, but finally after a while I was contacted by a mother of the clan on our now shared property. She was in great distress over the loss of many of her babies as they are taken just as our people go missing, possibly by the same beings. I knew nothing of Missing 401 at the time and reached out to a few researchers. You can imagine how well that went. Poor sorry bastards have not a clue. I was able to get an energetic imprint on a photo of the ones that hunt, steal, and who knows what else with the Forester's youth. Heartbreaking, terrible agony of heart and soul the mother and I shared. She's the most beautiful and purest soul I've been blessed to know as of yet. Her pain and my de determination set me into a whole new instinct, driven desire to understand. I seem to be the most potent when helping others. It drove me to new acts I had no idea I was capable of. I finally understood myself to not be crazy the first picture I took, and the first video also, as the camera couldn't capture any hallucinations I may have had. I recorded a linebacker type stepping out of the wood line, looking at my friend and I briefly, and easing back into the wood line. Also, five different types of forestmen in the, in the first evening. I'm leaving out much. Then one evening, while the clan was hidden away, unavailable to me, I was told by the mother another baby was taken. I sat down, pissed, hurt, and determined to do whatever I could to help, help to combat the ones who come on the strange winds and weather. I had only started the process of making myself known to the hunters of the forestmen and the people. Soon realizing that this and more were not only possible for me, but now probable and tangible. I've had two of my little brothers taken, and Steve, they had their mother's beauty. Beauty of a different kind than physical, obviously. We still work, talk, and strive to end this plague upon us and them. The youth and I have our little wonderful games. I'm going to have to stop on this for a second, but gladly give you all the information that may help and lend my skill set, but only after I've tested the hearts of those involved. So, on a recent show of yours, you wondered what would happen if a man was brave enough to hold their gaze, to communicate their peaceful intentions to one. Not bragging, but I can tell you how many I've done that with. There are more here in my small community than there are sapiens. I'm accepted by all I've encountered, but I feel that it may not work that way for most. I've done a lot, but wouldn't suggest it. I'm always willing to die when I do. I'm very different. I always have been. It's cost me dearly. You have an idea of what it is to lend yourself to these endeavors. It pays no dividend, but more sorrow in the world of men. But I'm determined to help my neighbors, and hopefully my fellow man, to end this nightmarish taking and using of both our youths and kind. Much, much more to this story. So much more. I appreciate what you're doing to give heart to the ones who speak, and then marginalized by the classless society in which we live. Once viewed from the outside and retrospectively, it's not fully living. What's a man to do that is more alive and purposed in the world of forest men than in ours? Withstand, persevere, and live ready to die. I've got a few good picks and a lot of knowledge and could use a few more like me. I've only met one person that I know is and will be potent and effective in such matters. She's better than me in the skilled ways of the talented people, but only was close to her for a few days. Then one other, a best friend lost early on as I was working on my otherworldly skills. That's a whole other novel that I'd have to type, but I've had enough for today. Probably for a while. Take care, Steve. It's not the forest men we need to worry about. There's so much more. I walk back and forth between realms when in my hours of potency. I go farther, deeper, and hope to study, learn, till time ends. It's what the F I do, A-B. All right, man. Like I said earlier to you, thank you very much for getting a hold of me. And I asked you if, if you wished I'd share this. And you said, uh, you said to leave it up to me whether or not I want to share it with the people or not. So there you go. Shared. I think he may have emailed me before. Maybe you emailed me the first email before this one. If, I, if you did, I'll go back and I'll find it and I'll share that one as well. And um, I am... I'll. I can't speak for everyone else here, but I am definitely uh, looking forward to hearing back from you with more, for sure, again. And if you have sent me another one since I read this, I will find it, and I will share that too. And I'll, as long as you keep sharing, I'm going to keep sharing with the people too. All right? So thanks again for, for t contacting me to share with the people. And uh, 
Make sure you don't stop, all right? We want to hear this and see this through to the end. All right, what do we got here? Well, this looks like a long one. I'm going to go for it. Hopefully there's batteries in this thing. G'day, Steve. If you get a moment, I understand you're a very busy bloke. I'd like your perspective on an experience I had. I don't mind if you read it or not on your channel. Completely your choice, mate. Thank you in advance. Kind regards, JM. G'day, Steve. Please just use my initials. My name is JM from Bathurst, Australia, in the state of New South Wales. I would like to apologize in advance for any poor grammar or spelling mistakes as I pound this out with two fingers and my tongue doing stupid gymnastics. A brief personal history for perspective. I grew up in remote bush on large farms from the flat country to the biggest mountains we have. It was a blessed upbringing full of bush, horses, farming, hunting, etc. I love all these things. After high school, I was a farmhand for a couple of years before becoming an adventure guide for Outward Bound Australia. I became an experienced guide specializing in rock climbing and abseiling and personally gained some great experiences in mountaineering and multi-pitch natural, i.e. carry all of your fall protection and leave nothing permanent, rock climbing. For pure patri patriotism, I then joined the Australian Army as a medic and a mechanic. I seemed to understand how things work on a structural level. I spent six years in the Army. Good times, great experience, and lifelong brother bonds that live on. Unfortunately, my knees didn't last. On a side note, I'm a passionate conservationist. I hunt feral species or natives in unhealthy populations check. Quick humane deaths are always priority, as is our human responsibility. That'll do. Any questions, I'm happy to expand on. I have some pics of the area and my campsite date stamped. My experience, I was inside a water collection reserve approximately 25 kilometers from town at the Feeder River for a water reserve for our surrounding area. I stupidly, being on my own, took the high north side of the dam where the rocks can hardly hang on due to the presence of a ranger doing something on the south track side. Long story short, I made it around an inaccessible to most way into the feeder river with a bow and reconfirmed that I'm a lousy fisherman as I tried it at lunch break. The trout may have well given me the fish finger. I made it to camp late afternoon and shortly after I heard feral goats coming down for a drink. I got a white and brown one, mid-aged, because I forgot my curry kit. I left it where it fell in the dry creek bed full of tea tree, about 35 meters in from the water line and approximately 85 meters from where I'd set up my hoochie. Time passed until dark, quiet normally in this natural Eden, minimally frequented by man, but not open to public, just beautiful. I remember it being hot as I stood next to my small fire, just staring at it, the gentle breeze pushing a bit of smoke at me, helping to keep my the mozzies off, and I started to smell the worst smell I've ever smelt, a combination of piss, shit, B.O., rotting meat, etc. It was really foul. I remember lifting my nose to the air as a more of a body language thing as much for practi practicality's sake in the direction of the incoming breeze. It remained for about 30 to 40 seconds and went. It might be circling, I thought, knowing I had water at my back. A full alert because I'd never smelt anything like this odor ever. I kept relaxed body language and put a couple bigger bits of wood on the fire. Approximately 15 minutes later, 180 degrees behind me now, and over the south side of me where the feeder river joins the lake, I heard a growl, roar, wheeze noise. Not crazy loud, but very deep and with layers of noise I cannot hope to replicate. Now I was 85% alert, as I had never heard this noise in the bush either, ever. And I've been pissed on by a wild koala, etc. I.e. I've spent more time in the bush than most will be lucky enough to. Alert and still by the fire, I sauntered over to my hoochie and casually put my webbing on, which had a large knife on it. Now I had two decent knives on me. Realizing my bow was basically useless at night, I put a little more wood on the fire. A couple of times I swept around with my small torch, but could see nothing. No eye shine, nothing. But something was around. Strangely, the thought of the light go panther stuck into my head. It's a local legend about a Black Panther accidentally released here by an American Air Force squadron in World War II. My mind quickly made up that running away in dense and thick scrub in the dark was a worse idea than fighting with two large knives. It was a definite and conscious decision to fight. I was quite intent to look outwardly relaxed, although inside I was at 100% alert. All my senses were at capacity. 20 to 30 minutes after the growl, I had resigned myself to laying down and under 
lying down under my hoochie, webbing, and pack built up around my head and neck area. With the knife in each hand, expecting to have about two seconds max to stab a big cat in the face slash neck as it went for mine. This tactic was all I could think from watching big cat documentaries. Then lying on my back, I hear an average sized kangaroo hopping quite calmly down for a drink, very close to where I heard the growl. Everything was calm and I seemed to go quiet for maybe 10 seconds and then the kangaroo went crazy. Kangaroos go into water as a protective measure against predators such as dogs, etc., and are quite adept at drowning them with their front arms. The river at this point was slow moving, 15 to 18 meters wide and chest deep on me. I'm six feet exactly. Well, the roo splashed and thrashed around and made it out the other side, took off fast, slapping the ground every hop, as they do to alert the other roos, etc. Now I was really alert, 100% in fact, as it quickly dawned on me that it was a predatory animal willing to have a crack at a fully grown roo. I stayed awake for probably 45 minutes after that, and I actually said a prayer too. I remember my auntie talking about guardian angels. I asked the big man that if I did actually have one, can you please make them available for the night to watch over me? Strangely, I slept, I slept quiet well after that. No recollection of anything else weird that night. I have quite an inquiring mind too, yet when I woke up at dawn, I felt strongly that I was in someone else's house. And when I started looking around for tracks in the mud down by the river, I felt like I'd gone to rummaging through the fridge, to the point that I didn't even go and inspect the goat carcass. Was it gone? I don't know. Didn't want to feel the pressure of that area anymore. I packed up quickly but properly, removing all trace except the coals and left. I walked out along the south side track this time and actually startled what I assumed was the kangaroo from the night before. 25 meters away, asleep in the sun in the hollow base of a tree, 300 to 350 meters away from the incident, covered in glossy lick marks from dying itself. Since then, I've returned twice during the day but have not spent the night there again, and the whole experience doesn't add up or sit right with me. I'd value your thoughts on what the hell it might have been, as we don't have any big predators down this way. The biggest I know of being wild dogs and pigs that predate on sheep. Steve, thank you for all the unbiased sharing of people's experiences and providing a platform for us who wish to inquire to be able to soak up the experience of others through you, safely. Kindest regards, sincerely, J.M. Well, J.M., like I said to you know, previous people have emailed me the same inquiries. Um, fly it out. If, if, you're, if you're actually going online seeking out this topic and you find my YouTube channel and then you actually go out of your way to get my email and contact me and ask me what I think, I think it's pretty safe to say you already know what it was or wasn't, right? So you've heard all the numerous dozens of testimonies here of people sensing the exact same things and feeling the exact same way as you. And I felt that too. And I call it pressure as well and uh, it's just time to leave. And I've ran into big cats numerous times in the woods. I've, I've ran into grizzly bears, black bears, wolves, wolverine, you name it, I've ran into it. And not one of them has been able to give off a feeling of, for me to get my ass out of here before they came inside of me. Not one of them, so. But I don't know what to say, man. It sure isn't a good experience, is it? That feeling, especially when you're an experienced outdoorsman like yourself. Um, it sure is a confusing feeling to deal with when you're not used to that feeling that insecure about being in the woods in the natural world, right? It's a real, it's a real struggle. It's a real struggle to understand what just happened, and it's a struggle to react the right way. It's a struggle to not react the way you really want to react, which is run and scream like a little girl guide, right? <laughs> but there you go. It's about all I can say to it, man. I wasn't there. You were. You smelt it. You sensed it. And uh, there's enough information, honest information here from all the past contributors that uh, it's pretty safe to say what it was you encountered that evening, I'd say. But anyway, there you go, you guys. I'm going to move this microphone and move up and see if I can get some more shared before I go in. And because uh, these thermal winds are really starting to rip up. But anyway, there you go. There's more coming. Oh, yeah. Oh, this is a comfy spot. All right, this is really comfy. Easy to read this one. Or these ones, what are we gonna do? All right, here we go, what do we got? Get right into it. Get dark here pretty quick and I'm starving. 
Ojibwa story. Good day to you. My story is kind of boring, but it is a story. What I mean is that I've never had the dread, but I've been watched. I've had that feeling. I've roamed the ditch banks, which is a failed attempt by the government to make farmers out of the Native Americans by digging ditches through a large tract of land to drain it off. Fond du Lac tribe was the target. I guess they weren't having it. I'm a I'm a Millilax band of Ojibwe member, Bear Clan, but I pretty much live amongst the Fond du Lac. My brother is a doctor here and serves them well from what I gather. There's a lot of goodness in the ditch banks. I've gathered berries and nuts and grapes, grouse, deer, ducks, wild rice, maple sap. Every every single thing in Anishinaabe would want, which means which means original man in Ojibwe. Bugwejinini. That's our word for wild man. Some of our people call them to be the watchful ones. They aren't to be feared, but they're also not to be seen. But legends tell us that fear comes anyway to people on the foolish tasks. I've been roaming the ditch banks for almost 40 years. There's ghosts there, but they're mostly memories that didn't leave. Some people see traces of them. I haven't. But I feel things that I only feel there, and it's always spiritual. In fact, when I feel my spirituality slipping, I can always find my bearings there again. I'm an Indian. I took my son on a few camps in the ditch banks. I think he was probably 13 this particular time, although I took him several times before. We made a deer camp rough as it was. Not many Minnesota deer hunters would have it. I didn't want my son to believe in hunting like money. Money isn't life. We were letting the fire die out. I've always taught him to keep his back to the fire and his eyes in the forest. He's probably the only guy in his circle that does that to this day. He brought it up to me that night that something was moving behind his vision. All right, I thought. Things can get a bit freaky out there. He's just a kid, I can't blame him. Then the noise came about ten minutes later, and it started out low and became higher, then went to low again. I've never heard that sound before, nor have I heard it again. But I have an immense respect for that area, and I've found other things there that are particularly intriguing. One of which is a population of red squirrels that gather mushrooms. They don't come by that by instinct. It's a taut mannerism. Stash and branches of spruce trees, and there's other things out there that were brought to my attention by others that I'm not at liberty to share without showing firsthand. Some things can't be told with credibility. Eyes are the convincer. This I know for a fact. Anyway, that's my story. All right, man. Brandon, I appreciate you sending in your story. And uh, if you want to share more in the future, please feel free to, to share it here. If you want to share it with the people, then we'll get it done, all right? Appreciate it all. Man, these mosquitoes are coming out. They want my ass. Steve, reading your book brought back memories and the courage to talk about it. When I was 17, I and a buddy were on a seven-day canoe trip down the Namakagan, Namakagan River in Wisconsin. The Nam flows into the St. Crow, Crow River which is the river that makes the state line of Minnesota and Wisconsin. It was late July, hot and sunny with high winds. I was in the rear of the canoe with my buddy up front. The river was narrow with a nice current. We rounded a bend and saw what we thought was a man. We were a good hundred yards away. He was squatting at the river's edge. I let the canoe drift with the current. Our eyes were locked on the guy. The guy didn't seem to notice us due to the wind and the leaves. The closer we got to the guy, he looked like he was wearing a large black dark brown pants with a black slash dark brown hoodie with the hood up. Very weird since it was very hot out. As we drifted closer we could see he was opening the river clams with his fingers and then eating them. We drifted closer with the current. We were about 25 yards away when my brain, when my brain grasped what was going on. This was not a man. He looked up. He stood up. It was huge but not bulky. His hair was long in spots but shorter in others. He turned and walked up the hill behind him. My buddy said nothing. We drifted for a few minutes and I asked my buddy if he was okay. He turned and started to cry, saying, What well, was that thing? For some reason, we were exhausted. On the next island we came to, we stopped to camp. My friend was in a daze. I set up the camp and started dinner. My friend started talking more, which was a good sign. Then the rock throwing started. Something was throwing huge rocks in the river near our camp. It was not pine cone or branch or fish jumping. These were the loud sound of large rock. We shined our flashlights at the riverbank, but didn't see anything. This went on for a few hours, so we sat up all night with a large fire until first light. We left and didn't talk about it again. I'd never seen my friend cry. He was a badass. This encounter changed us. Thanks for giving us a safe place to talk about the wild things. Be well, Chris. 
Wow, Chris. I appreciate that share, man. And it's too bad your buddy had that reaction, but uh, these experiences of seeing these things have brought some pretty big, tough people down to their knees, blubbering like little infants, right? What an experience. So many people are emailing in. So many. It's amazing. You almost got to wonder why. I guess, I don't know. I've had a lot of people ask me, why am I getting so email? How can I have this many emails? You know, they'll rattle off somebody else's name or group or whatever and say they don't get half as many. I don't know. I haven't a clue why. You'll have to ask the people that are emailing in or maybe the people that are emailing in can offer up why they chose this place to finally send in their experiences. Maybe they could put that in the comment section below so everybody will understand why. Because um, there's nothing going on behind the, scene, behind the scenes, nothing at all. What I get, I share with you guys, the people, and it's the people that are sharing with the people through me, for the people, right? So there's nothing going on. This is about as true and raw as it gets. Maybe that's why. I, have no clue. I mean, I, I know of a handful of other groups or, or places where you could share your, your encounters previously and it's pretty obvious why it's not such a cool choice to make right so anyway bit of a babble all right found the bug juice in the truck hallelujah <laughs> all right you talk about puzzle pieces all the time well i hope these two will help someone my name is Dean, and I'm no writer, so I'll do my best. All right, Dean, I'm appreciating it already. Just the fact that you mentioned the puzzle and the pieces and adding, adding to the pile, it's awesome. When I was about 13 or so, I got interested in ninjas. I read about the history and some of the training of the, that the practitioners did. One skill that stood out was the ability to sense someone you can't see. A friend and I went to the park. I put on a blindfold and earplugs, and I sat in the grass. I asked him to walk away and then sneak up on me from a different direction. Each time he did, I would raise my hand and point at him as soon as I perceived him. At first, I felt him at about six or seven feet away, but the more we played this game, the better I got. We traded places and kept at it for an hour or two. In the weeks to follow, I practiced in my room at home. I got to the point where I could see my mom or dad walking down the hall outside my room with the door shut and the blindfold and earplugs on. I'd jump up and open the door for confirmation. They probably thought I was nuts, but as long as my homework and chores were done, it was okay. One day I was trying to see outside my house. I could see the side of our house and the fence and finally over the fence. I saw the neighbor weeding his side yard. I was worried that I imagined this, so I opened up my window, removed the screen, and, and climbed out onto a stack of wood. Standing on the road, I could see over the fence. I felt kind of creepy looking over the fence in my neighbor's yard, but there he was, just as I had seen from my bedroom. All it took was, all it took was practice. I don't know if this is a kind of sixth sense, but it was fun to play with, at least until I found out girls were cool. <laughs> Puzzle piece number two. I'm part Native American. When I was 25, I got very interested in my Native culture. I asked my parents, but they thought it was a waste of time. We don't live that way anymore, was the response I got. The next year, I went and visited the reservation in South Dakota, where my father was from. I stayed all summer and finally found some older Natives who would talk about the traditional ways. One afternoon, I was told that my great-grandmother was willing to talk to me, so I spent the afternoon with her. This is one of the stories she told me. She said that when she was a little girl, she was 97 years old when we talked, her grandmother told her of a gathering she had gone to when she was a child. Several bands of the Lakota tribe had come together for a ceremony. I did the math, and this would have been in the early 1800s. She said to my great-grandmother that she had sat and watched her group of elders, old men, sitting in a circle and talking for th two to three hours. The thing was, they did not speak. They looked at one another as if that person was speaking. They laughed at times as if someone said something funny. They even disagreed with each other, but not a word was spoken aloud. My great-grandmother told me that they were speaking a long-forgotten language, one that even the animals could understand. Wow. Well, that's it. Take it for what it's worth. I hope these pieces help someone put their own puzzle together, and thank you for what you're doing. I've learned over the years that it is a man's responsibility to look out for others, to help those in need. I believe that is what you're doing. P.S. Trust me, you will brush and ride Mr. Macaroni again in the next world. He's waiting for you and watching you every day. Right on, man. Thanks a lot. I appreciate those words. And I double appreciate you sending in that email and sharing it with us. And I hope your uh, 
offering up of those puzzle pieces fits somebody's puzzle and helps them out. That's very, very interesting what you just shared, and I don't doubt it for one second at all. Okay, so here is the second email from the man I previous I mentioned previously, who I said this is possibly going to be one of those contacts we make that might bring a lot of puzzle pieces to us. So let's hear it. Hey Steve, here's the second encounter. Along about 77 or 78, we had around 10 head of hogs and an American wire pen with two strands of barbed wire around the top, basically designed to keep everything out. My pap and myself fed the cattle first, as always. All were present and accounted for. Once we were done with them, we headed to the hog pen. We got within 20 feet and found all of them dead. Claw marks down both sides and several with the insides removed. We left immediately and returned home to make a call to the Sheriff's Department. We met with law enforcement and the West Virginia DNR. Both inspected the scene and then had a conversation in private. They proceeded to tell my pop that it was done by a bobcat. Said it was a closed case and they apologized for the loss of livestock. Not until years later, once I got in my late teenage years, did I realize that a bobcat could not have done this. I honestly believed that my pop knew what happened, but just went along with the authorities. I have a few more I'll share soon. Thanks again for being the voice for those of us who know the truth. Brad Arvin. Right on, Brad. Appreciate it, man. Like I promised earlier, you keep sending them. I'll keep sharing them. Appreciate it. My name is Dave. I live on Vancouver Island in Victoria. I grew up in Langford, 20 minutes out of Souk, where you are from. I'm 45 years old. Well, actually, I'm, more, I'm actually from Victoria, and I lived in Langford as well, Machosa, and I lived in Souk. I'm going to guess that it was about 10 years old. I was about 10 years old, or 10 to 12 years old at the time. My mother's friend from high school was asking me if I wanted to go come check a deer feeder or a salt lick up the couch and mountains as we were staying at Ben's Marina in Yubo. <laughs> you know, Ben's Marina in Yubo, that's where my grandparents used to stay all the time. And uh, that's actually exactly where that photograph of myself and my grandfather are when I was that big in the boat. As we were staying at, at Ben's Marina. So I'm very familiar with where you are. This meant that we had to go down the dirt logging road beside the old mill. We hopped on my mom's friend's Jeep and continued up the mountain that turned off of the logging road. We were crossing a dried up river bank or a dried up stream as it was incredibly hot. Me and my mom's friend's son got out of the jeep while his dad was checking to see if there was any deer sign. I heard some rustling in the bushes over to my right only to see some red hair disappear behind some bushes that the sunlight was shining on. It looked like it was lit up by the sun shining through the trees. I immediately notified the adult in the situation and I mouthed the words, I think it's a bear to him. Just as I had mouthed these words to him, all of a sudden we heard a deep voice, sounding like it was in some other language, maybe samurai chatter language like some people say. At the end of this chatter we heard an incredibly deep breath, like a sigh of a human breathing incredibly deep and sounding like a big oof, as the voice sounded like it was impatient with us prodding around looking for a sign. Immediately we were told to get back in the jeep, I believe some choice profanities were used and all I remember was running and feeling like I was going to lose bowel control. He used to say we continued back down the mountain to our trailers. Fast forward to two mornings later I think it was about 5 30 in the morning when I heard what sounded like a siren sound across couch and lake for about 10 to 12 seconds. As I was sitting in my boat I looked up on the side of the mountainside to see a tree swaying back and forth in multiple directions which made me feel as if whatever creature was doing this which we all know what it was, could see me as if I was a sitting duck in a boat on a huge lake. Which seems stupid, as the lake is so huge and the mountain's so big and so far away. Which unfortunately, which unfortunately, or fortunately, this is my last experience with what I would say was most definitely one of those damn things. Since that time, I've been somewhat leery about going into the forest, and I wish I could face my fear and learn to relax, which I will in the future. The very, which I will in the future, the very near future. Thank you, Steve, for giving us this. Thank you, Steve, for giving us all a voice and giving us our courage back to enjoy the forest where we are, I believe, where we are supposed to be and how we are supposed to be as hunters and gatherers. Thanks again, Steve, for the platform that you provide us all and my very sincere condolences for the loss of your beloved friend, Macaroni. 
I could care less about who thinks of me about my encounters. I know who I am. All the rest of the trolls should work on finding the same. As it is very nice to kick somebody while they're down, especially when they have been through something that has given them tremendous PTSD. All right, man. Dave, thanks for that email, buddy. And uh, I think I gotta have a funny feeling that might have been Cottonwood Creek where you guys went, possibly, right? And uh, I'm sure you probably know by now there is piles of sightings around Couch and Lake, tons and tons and tons. And where I had something happen there a couple weeks ago, that was actually due west of Couch and Lake by about I don't know an hour and a half is where I had the the oh shit feeling and I packed up the video camera and left. But anyway, Dave, if you're still hanging around the couch in Lake Area, you go just ask around. Ask around anybody for uh, anything they may have heard of or seen, and I'll guarantee you people are going to come forward and share. Guaranteed. Northern Alaska. Hello, Steve. Long time viewer of your channel. Back from when you were focused on hunting. While I miss those hunting story videos, I appreciate the no BS community you have made. And some of the stories you've shared made me realize what I've experienced. You're welcome to share this if you want. I've left out specific areas just in case. This is a bit of a long one, but here we go. Okay, man, just so you know, um, I have another channel I'm transferring all the hunting content to. It's called How to Hunt, one word, to find on YouTube. And uh, it's still rocking it out, just minus all of this, all right? I grew up in the Chugach Forest area in Alaska, where I've had, I think, eight trail cameras taken <laughs> over the years and now live in the northern interior where my family has lived off the land for several generations hunting and mushing growing up i spent much of my time in the woods and i'm still an avid outdoorsman spending summers backpacking hunting and fishing i've never been afraid of animals here having close encounters with curious black bears and even attacked by a wolf i cornered in his den while fishing grayling however several experiences up here stopped me from wherever i'm going in the woods alone again after finishing high school, I moved up north into a small dry cabin in the river valley that my mother had grown up in. It was only after living here for a year that some of the stories from her childhood began to make sense. Weird things began happening at night around a month of moving here. The cabin was right near a game trail, so we had moose and wolves, and even once a lynx moved through pretty often. So a lot of the noises at night, at first I chalked up to animals checking us out. However, one night, my girlfriend pointed out she could hear something circling the cabin, but it didn't sound like normal. Listening closer, it sounded like he was on two feet. We just shook, we just shook the thought out of our minds that night and went to sleep. One night, we heard something up on the porch. Thinking it was a black bear trying to get in for food, I ended up yelling at it from inside. You could hear something heavy run off the porch. I grabbed my bear gun from above the door and went outside with a headlamp to either send the bear a message or fill the freezer for winter. Going out there and behind the cabin, I couldn't see anything moving while shining my light through the woods, especially absolutely nothing. Suddenly I got the feeling like nothing else. More fear than I've ever felt having a wolf come after me. I couldn't see anything, but I could hear someone walking out there and close by. It was the same biped footsteps as before, and I could hear them getting closer and louder but even in the light, couldn't see anything out there. I thought I'd pissed off the spirit or something and back back inside the cabin. Soon things only got worse. Whatever this was kept coming back, brushing up against the side of the cabin, tapping on the walls, tapping on the door, sliding the magnetic mosquito netting up and away from the metal door. One night, shaking the door knob, it would throw pebbles and bounce them off the tin roof for what felt like hours. You could hear it come up on the porch and sit there. This being terrorized us at least twice a week until winter came. Winter was mostly quiet, but these visits started up again once the snow melted. It started with the pebbles on the roof, then the tapping on the door at night, until one night my girlfriend had gotten up to go to the outhouse at 2 or 3 in the morning. As she was leaving the outhouse, there was what she had said was the loudest, almost feline growl from on the side of the outhouse. It was so loud it woke me from a dead sleep inside the cabin and had me out the door with my bear gun when I realized she was outside. My girlfriend was yelling at me that it was behind the outhouse, but again, I saw absolutely nothing back there from on the porch and had her slowly come inside. After this, we didn't hear it for a few weeks, but one night, out of the blue, something hit the side of the cabin so hard it shook the whole cabin. It woke us both up yelling. I swear a tree had fallen on the cabin. 
Going outside that morning, there was nothing. No tree, not even a branch had fallen. Some time had gone by, and then we heard pebbles again. And all of a sudden, something hit the side of the cabin again, just like before. It shook the cabin like an earthquake and was loud. We moved out two months before our lease was up. It's been two years since then, and it was only after watching your videos that I'd ever realized what the hell it was. I've been living in the middle of town since, and, I'll, well, and while I absolutely hate it here, the thought of living out there again scares me. I still struggle sleeping, with every little bump in the night spiking my adrenaline and having me wide awake. I get it, man. I get it. On to my mother's story. She grew up deeper in the valley, by the river, mushing dogs, and she'd always tell me to watch out for bears when I was younger, recounting her memories as a child playing in the woods and feeling like she was being watched, being stalked by what she called large bears. She once described that she could smell them before she ever heard them, saying that they smelled like a musk of death and rot. She would smell and hear them in the woods and get that feeling on occasion. She told me that they would follow her home but never got very close. It's been nearly 40 years since she grew up there, but while I lived there in that valley, I never saw a single bear or a sign of bears, nor have I ever smelled bear like that. I'm still not quite sure what to make of that. One last one for you. This experience truly solidified the existence for me. This past summer, I was out on a fishing trip. We had stopped about 50 miles outside of the town we were going to be fishing out of and slept in the mountains. I'd seen a black bear sow and two cubs about a mile down the mountain we, and headed the direction of my camp. So we slept in the bed of my truck that night with the tarp strapped over the truck. I woke up in the middle of the night absolutely shaking. I felt uneasy. So I hopped into the cab of my truck and my girlfriend and I slept there instead. As we were breaking camp in the morning, I looked up on the mountainside above us. And about 100 yards from us, there was obvious biped footprints through the snow straight up to the summit of this mountain. They went from the road we came on, according to Google Maps, at 2,400 feet and then went straight to the summit at 3,900 feet. The snow there was easily up to my hip, but those footprints looked effortless. As soon as we saw that, we didn't stick around long enough to make breakfast. We just threw out things in my truck and left in a hurry. I'm still kicking myself for not taking a picture of from camp. Thank you for giving us a place to talk about this tea. KT, I appreciate it, man. And, uh... If you know of anyone else that wants to share anything they may have experienced in the same area or anywhere around you or anybody you know, and if they might be troubled as well and they want to want to start the process of being able to speak openly about this with confidence, then you tell them to email all of us here at sharemystoryhowtohunt.com or tellmystoryhowtohunt.com and we'll get to it and we'll share their encounter and they'll be treated with absolute respect like everybody is and should be right but yeah i've been in the cabin with it getting beat on by myself and it shook the entire thing and the wood stove and the pipe and everything and it scared the absolute living shit out of me <laughs> but it is what it is and uh that mountain you guys can all see right behind me there is more sightings and encounters ringing that mountain right behind me than you can shake a stick at it's endless there's sightings right around where I am right now, too. They're everywhere. There's nothing anybody can do about it. There's, nobody could stop these facts. Nobody can twist them around, deny them in any way. This shit's going down. So, take from it what you will, or leave it. <laughs>